Hey, everybody. Welcome to the official Do Good Better podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Kirby. And of course, this show is for all the small nonprofits doing wonderfully great big things. But sometimes you want to learn from folks who are outside of our little wheelhouse, things that you want to have conversations with people that you never thought you'd have conversations with. Holy crap, do I have a show for you today. With us, Kishana Palmer, she is a, uh, a speaker, she's an educator, she's a trainer, she's a coach, she is a recovering fundraiser. And for those of you in the nonprofit world, this makes perfect sense. She's the founder and CEO of Kishana & Co. Kishana Palmer, welcome to the official Do Good Better hey. podcast today. I feel like I needed my own version of like walk on music. Like that was amazing. <laughs> I feel like we can edit that in for you. Yes. I'm like, I love it. I need it. <laughs> I'm going to follow you around. I'm going to be your own hype man. For the yes. I love day. it. That would make every entrance so much better. Oh yes. my God. <laughs> I love it. All right. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, um, we have a, we're going to talk about management. We're going to talk about leadership. We're going to talk about uh, nonprofits, uh, roles of women in color. We're going to have a, we have a whole things to talk about. However, you name it. Yes. Right? We're going to have some fun today. If people are scrolling through, they're looking at YouTube, they're going through their, uh, their podcast, their favorite podcast channel. They look at uh, Kishana Palmer. This sounds like an interesting topic of conversation, but I have no idea who she is. Tell us a little bit about who you are, where you come from, what do you do? The floor is yours. Yes, I'm somebody's mama, y'all. They gave me a kid. Okay, let's start there. So I am the, the solo mama to a queenager. That's what I call my, listen, y'all, I'm surviving and having a teenager at the house, okay? So anybody who has survived having a teenager or you just knew you were a cutting up as one, you know my pain. Uh, <laughs> and I am a New York native, born and raised. Um, I am Caribbean American, a first generation American and very proud of that. And I have spent just about my entire career in the social sector as a fundraiser. I did a brief stint in investment banking, but we will not talk about that <laughs> today. I, I fast realized I loved money, but I really enjoy making sure that it goes to social good. And so um, you can find me at any time. Well, now during this darn uh, COVID, I'm at the house, y'all. Mm -hmm. But typically, you could find me rolling through somebody's airport, either on a way to a speaking engagement or to my uh, newest uh, haunt at a uh, travel destination. But I'm obsessed with people. Mm. And that's kind of funny, Patrick, because I'm an introvert. So, you know, how is Funny. That? I would have oh. never pegged you for that. How is that a thing? I, I, like, I'm like, people are like, I want to get out. I'm like, do I want to get out the house? I don't know. Um, but I love people and I love the story of people. I love how people work, how people function. And one of the things that I learned very early on in my career is that I knew how to raise money. I could do that really, really well. But what I could do fantastically well was manage people. And I just had a knack for understanding what it took to motivate folks to move on things that we needed to do and how to help people discover their wheelhouse and their zone of genius so that they could like really execute on the work we had to do and feel really good about work. And so, you know, that's a little bit about me. I love it. A lot of, I think, of individuals who work in the nonprofit role have so many hats that they don't take their zone okay. of genius and then sort of engage in it. So I'm, I'm really excited to talk about that. But you got into leadership management roles really early, uh, right? So, I mean, you came out of grad school and you were running a show, right? I was. That, right, your first experience, because I think there's a lot of individuals who love the idea of working in a nonprofit, being a leadership role, blah, blah, blah. They get thrown to the wolves right away and they go, now what the hell do I do, right? Exactly. So, Walk through Good. your experience because I'm really interested about how you as a young person taking on a leadership role and how you manage that. So, you know, really I, was, I was the young person that even as a kid was the one in charge, right? So I'm like eighth grade class president. I rather than join groups in high school, I started my own clubs. You know, I was president of my student union in college. Like I just, you know, I'm used to running the things. Yeah. And so I think I always knew that I would do something where I was helping to like lead and grow people, but I didn't know what that looked like. So my first management job, y'all, I was a mess, not going to lie. I was like straight out of grad school, very little work experience. I had been working since I was a kid, but in terms of like post undergrad professional work experience. And so I had to learn fast and I failed fast and I had to really like get in my books um, at that time, I was like, what can I read? We didn't have podcasts and stuff then. Oh my gosh, I'm really aging myself. And so it was really about what books. Can I... The internet was still new. Sheesh. 
Like, what books can I read? Like, who can I follow in terms of literally physically around um, who will allow me to be able to learn from them? And I learned really early on that I needed to do more listening than talking. And I learned really early on that folks come to work with their own mental model and their own lived experience. And it wasn't my job to help them to change that way. It was my job to help find a way to meld us together so that we could meet and exceed our goals and so that people felt seen. And I didn't have the words for it then, but I had the instinct really early. But where instinct fell short, learning came in and that was on the job and that was being unafraid to ask questions and that was a lot of study, you know, the leadership books of that day um, and really trying to figure out how to put that into practice. And some of the stuff felt like, st like stiff and I felt stifled and I was like, there's gotta be a better way. And I was like, well, what if I lead with relationships first? And what if I lead with seeing people for who they are first and then about the work we have to do as separate? And I think my management style and my management philosophy Un unbeknownst to me, like developed really, really early on. But I didn't know what I was doing, y'all, initially. I just have to say. I love that. We talk a lot about here uh, that fundraising is nothing more than relationship building in the first place, right? So you, you've taken sort of that and, and, and left with it. Um, you, you mentioned asking questions. Is, do you, are you finding for those that you're working with or you've worked in that I think people may be afraid to question or to ask questions because they're afraid that they either don't know the answer, they don't know the full story, and because they uh, fear that, they don't ask questions, therefore they're stuck in the rut and they can't get out of it. Is that part of what you're seeing across the nonprofit Absolutely. world? We don't want to be found out. Like, think about when you were a kid and you, like, messed up something at home and you tried to hide it not because you were a dishonest person, but because you just did not know what the fallout was going to be with your parents, you know? And so I think that we, we a lot of us, and particularly depending on um, how old you are right now, what generation you're from, many of us grew up with a lot of negative reinforcement as the stick that got us to do things and not a lot of positive reinforcement as the carrot. And so you bring that into your working life where now you don't want to ask for help. You don't want to tell people you don't know because you're in a position that you're supposed to, and I put that in quotation marks, mm -hmm. you're supposed to know. And so it's hard to then ask for help or to say, I don't have it. And do you know better? Because you might perceive, you might be perceived as not having the leadership stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you don't know, ask the question with your true north and your mission in, in, in mind first. If you ask the question like, how do I help or help me or am I doing the right thing to get to wherever my mission is, everybody's going to help you out across the board, right? Exactly. I think that, and for those who don't, well, maybe that's not your place to be. Mm -hmm. But by and large, we want to be seen. Mm -hmm. We want to connect with others. Mm -hmm. And many of us want to help. And the help, the ask for help has to feel personal and it has to feel needed. And that's a little subjective. Yeah. But by and large, we want that connection. We want that connective tissue. Mm -hmm. And so if we think about how we lead from a place of continuing to build and to weave that connective tissue, then it feels a lot more doable and it feels a lot more manageable than if we distance ourselves between the sort of, sorry, y'all, between the sort of like us and them. Mm -hmm. with, the, uh, what I hear my clients and my team used to say all the time, the management, mm -hmm. when leadership, those over there, we're not over there. You mean me, your manager, the person who's making the decisions, like really bringing it into view, mm -hmm. I think is really important for us to uh, do as we. You know, I think part of that too is there's there's the, the that fear of the board too, right? That over like the mystery smoke filled room of the board of directors, and they just sit back there and they're like, Ugh, "I'm going to make all of these decisions." One of the things that we teach, um, you know, here when we're talking about solicitation is if you don't know the answers, go in with the question to a donor or a board member. So, for example, of like, "Hey, I'm not asking you for money, but I'd really love your opinion." Like, this is an ask, but I want to test more of your uh, ability to help and them saying yes to asking a question or or helping you out with the solution is that first step in asking them for money most likely where you you have these relationships that you want to build from 
ground up, ask, asking the right questions and thinking about something that's not just fundraising or not just sort of the who, what, where, when, why of the sort of a mission that then bonds you on a level that's way more different and way more personal so that you can actually get to the root of the problem in the first place. Right. And I think that's one of the things that I learned really early on that was mm. such a gift for me, particularly because for many of the rooms that I walked into, I didn't have that bond with board members or donors. I didn't have that any immediate connection, at least not on the surface. Mm -hmm. And I think we oftentimes, we have this sort of utopian view, if you will, where we kind of, people are just people, true. Also, people are hardwired to see difference. And so yeah. I had to always remember, like one time I remember saying to a board member, you know I'm black, right? Like <laughs> some of the things that she would say, I was like, what in the ignorant racist? Yeah. What is happening here? Yeah. And I realized, oh, Kashana has got put into the category of the good black. Ooh. Mm. So I'm the exceptional leader. I'm the I'm the nominally. I'm the one that sort of like stands out on the ledge as the only. And I had to like help bring her in into mm. the sort of education. Did I want to help? No, I wanted to be like, lady, what's wrong with you? You are a grown person. Yeah. But I realized to do my job well, I have to get really good really quickly on understanding what is at the root of what people want mm -hmm. and what is at the root of what they're seeking mm -hmm. and part of people's ability to help organizations and to invest in organizations is an extension of how they see themselves in the world. Mm. Whether it's that they're gonna do good or that it's a family legacy or they were impacted by that mission or someone they know or love was, whatever the it is, there is a reason that goes beyond what we see about why folks are connecting and my job really early on was to understand that driver because it's important for me in particular to get to that yes and to get to that connection and to get to make sure they're a good fit mm -hmm. for us and the donor and for us and the board member. And so I had to learn that nuance really, really early. Mm -hmm. Part of what uh, you see all over the place is someone like you in the nonprofit world stands out. And, yeah. and I think, I think what we're seeing across the board right now is this sort of like weird lifting of the veil of like, wow, this is an issue still. I didn't really oh, understand. Like, weird, Patrick. I was like, like last month or three months ago. No, no, now it is. Fall. It's, it's a thing That's now. Right. It's a thing. It's right. A thing. It's a thing. So, cause I'd love to dive into this because it's a topic that's really, it's topical a, but B, um, there's a lot of individuals who are both new Americans, um, uh, women's leadership in color, uh, you know, people of color that are, this is not the hot topic. Now you go into organizations, long-term uh, foundations and, and big organizations who are now sort of uh, looking at, Oh, we should maybe fund some of these uh, pieces. How is it like, Walk me through that process too, because I think there's a lot of people who would love perspective on as somebody who's a new American, uh, as somebody who is a uh, a person of color in the nonprofit world. Is there a do you have to go about things differently? I know the answer is yes, but like walk <laughs> through, but like walk through that because uh, the next generation of nonprofit leaders is going to look dramatically different than dramatically this last different. One, right? How are how do we as a nonprofit uh, culture, right? Um, understand this per, from a perspective standpoint. I mean, I feel like I'm going to give y'all Kashana's perspective, understanding mm -hmm. that there are so many different layers right. and so many different ways we could, we could look at this. But for me, one thing is clear. The data does show us that by and large organizations led by uh, marginal uh, leaders who are from marginalized communities, whether you are black or you are Latina, or you are indigenous, or you are Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian, uh, a mix of any number of these permutations. If you are in the, the, even the term um, leader of color, if you US based, if you're a leader of color, by and large, the bar for you to get funded is higher. The length of time it takes for private foundations, for public found community foundations, for donors, individual donors to fund you is longer. And the amount of money you would get relative to your white peers with a similar mission is significantly less. Mm -hmm. And so folks like me are treading really hard underwater. And then if you go one more layer, if you are a 
development director, chief development officer, VP of advancement or development, leading the fundraising effort, and you are a person of color who identifies that way seven days a week, because everybody mm -hmm. does not, so people <laughs> identify as you when it's convenient. It's clear. Yeah. Um, but it brings another layer because you don't have that CEO story. You don't have that founder story. You don't come to the conversation with the I in your story. And then you still have that nuance, that layer of having to paddle harder underwater. And so what ends up happening is that you see a lot of organizations that are led by leaders of color um, are struggling to get the same funding that their counterparts whose programs are not better designed who do not have a more well thought out theory of action or theory of change, who don't have, who don't have better outcomes are being funded tenfold. Mm -hmm. And so it creates this huge fissure in our sector that mirrors what is happening in the corporate sector. And I think a lot of folks come into the nonprofit sector because they think it's going to be different, but friends, you model what you learned at home. You just bring that to college, you bring that to grad school, you bring that to work. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of lip service being paid to, oh, well, we want to do investment now. And all of a sudden, the yeah. realization that, uh, oh, maybe we haven't done what we needed to do uh, sort of thing. There is, I think, a risk because people have the attention span of gnats. Uh, to go back to the way things, good old boys club kind of things that they were uh, within the nonprofit sort of foundation sector uh, that way, right? Yeah. We pay enough lip service, we do enough little trifly uh, funding mechanisms to go to make the big check presentation to uh, uh, get us on Facebook where we're we're mm -hmm. all looking like a diverse group. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Let's look at all the diversity we brought in to write that five hundred dollar check to, right? Um, <laughs> Exactly. How, you know, as we're, as we're talking about systemic everything in this country right now, how do we solve the, or, or I mean, again, this is perspective only, this is one person's perspective, but it's a valuable one because you, you've lived through it for however 17, 20 years of doing this professionally, is um, how do we begin to change the conversation uh, from that systemic um, uh, disproportionate funding mechanism from, you know, taking it from a conversation of, yeah, I think we're going to do this now to, Let's show you what you got. Let's hold you accountable for that. Yeah, I think it's act then tell. Mm. Because I think a lot of times, what you just described, the dog and pony show, the big check thing, the big uh, huge yeah. statements, the website mm. splash page that's brand new, the pop up, all mm. of that is performance. Mm -hmm. It's performance mm. protest. It's performance allyship. It yep. is not deep seated stuff. In order to be able to do something systemically, you have got to decide from the board level to the leadership of the philanthropic entity mm -hmm. that you're going to do things different and that you're going to allow your program staff, many of whom are advocating for this change to actually do their darn jobs. And you've got to bring people to the table who are closest to the mission to be able to tell you what they need and then get them the money. If you're hiring consultants, pay the people. Mm -hmm. If you're bringing in a group of experts to do a focus group, pay them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then do what it is they suggest. Not just so they, you know what, that was a really good exercise. Uh, I, feel so, I feel so good about Take myself back now. back to the team mm. at our summer retreat and do our strategy session. And then nine months later, we're going to still be noodling on it. And then maybe we might produce something in a year. Like, I mean, oh, we looks really looks really good on that annual report cover though, it doesn't it? It does look really good though. It looks really good. Really and so sexy. we don't want folks to be disgruntled because you know, yep. I want folks to understand that like, if you hear me sounding like over it y'all, because I am over it. Mm -hmm. Because take that example times thousands mm -hmm. of examples, mm -hmm. times my whole life, and then in my career, my entire career, which is half my life. And so essentially, this is something that you're living day in, day out. So imagine, you're dealing, you're, you're, you're basically running uphill externally in the organization when you're thinking about raising money, mm -hmm. the, regardless of whether you're raising it from individuals or corporations or foundations. Yep. Then you come into your organization where it should be safe, mm -hmm. but you're running uphill with peers who might be trying to undermine you, with leadership who said they get it, but they don't put practices or procedures in place. And don't let you be a small shop where you have like about, a, their team is about the size of a polka dot. Because then you have the added pressure, real pressure of not having the time. 
and not making the time. And because you have to decide between lots of competing and urgent priorities, it's easier to not deal with that grief, with that discomfort, with putting yourself out of the way. So you, to your question, we have to reassert power differently, but the reassertion and the recalibration of power means that folks are gonna be uncomfortable. And by and large, we do not want to be uncomfortable. No, we do not. My fa- one of my favorite tweets, and, and I think it's become a meme now, is like, hey, thanks for your uh, support of Black Lives Matter. Uh, tell me again how many uh, people of color are on your board of directors and or executive team? Executive oh, yeah, team? thanks. Crickets. I, la- I, la- I laughed at that one so hard because you see this, you see this outward, uh, you know, this outward push of like, look at what we're doing, right? Mm-hmm. The performance art is great. And I don't, th- I think if you needed to find a, a better example or a more understandable example of privilege, and I, and I mean that across the board in the nonprofit yeah. sector, this is it, right? This is, this is the basis. These are, these are groups who well, we know how to fix uh, inner city, right. whatever, we, X, we Y, and Z. This. We've been at this for years. Have oh, we? we've been doing... Okay. All right. F- that's fair. Um, I think a lot of uh, individuals in, in positions, um, you know, like me, and I, again, I go with, look at my face. This is literally like the face of everybody. Like, I don't even know what to do, right? Because I think we acknowledge it. And, and as a, I'm a fixer. I, I want to just fix problems, right? I yeah. want to consult with small nonprofits and tell you how to do the damn thing. Yes. Right? Is, is, is there a fix? It, there's not an immediate fix. And I want that's, yeah. that's I think, the tough part for, for those of us who like quick and easy stuff. And I, you, I like that you said this is an uncomfortable conversation because you have to have this in the nonprofit world, that's even it. regardless, right? But, but what's the first step fix for someone like myself who is just, you know, I'm not in the weeds with this at all. And, and I, you know, there's no, I don't have relatability to this at all. Zero, the, the least. And so, but, but, my, but my heart's in the right place, but I have no actionable steps. And so where, where does the uncomfortability start, right? In conversations, where does it, and it's specifically maybe even tied to like leadership and, and what that yeah. looks like. What could so we I think, do? Yeah. I think in terms of the, what could we do? Like what bubbles to the surface is an example I've been using is the, um, the biggest loser. Mm. And folks saw that show, the biggest loser and on surface saw folks who had, you know, eaten their way to a particular size for a variety of reasons. They never even discussed on the show and then took these really extreme steps to shed themselves of that weight because of the thing that they were promised on the other side, sure money, but Mm. also what the promise of being thin supposedly gives you. But what they didn't discuss and what you don't see is that before you even get to the place where you can be selected for that show, you at home have to decide that you have had enough and that you are ready to do something different. And what must be going on in your mind to decide to do something that is extreme and then put yourself on TV for everybody else to see? It's got to mean that it hits you so viscerally that you go, well, I don't know how I can explain it. And I'm not even sure how I'm going to solve for it, but I'm going to decide to do something different. Let me go get involved in some stuff that I need to do. And so what I always say to folks in our sector is many of us, because not all of us, came into our work, whether you are on the finance team, in IT, whether you're in marketing and branding, operations or program, in development, you come into your organizations because you care about your mission. Your mission's purpose is designed to elevate and to shift the tide in your community, regardless of your topic issue. And we forget that at the base of that, the foundation of that is being an activist, working actively, to change the way something happens because we identified a problem and we see our organizations as a solution. And so if the folks who sit beside you every day say, hey friend, there is a problem. I need you to work with me to undo this and to solve this problem. You don't have to understand the depths of the problem to get it because the the activist in you should activate because that's why you joined your organization. So the muscle is there. And y'all need to get in the gym. And then for some of you, that means get in the gym of the library. Now in 2020, get in the gym of Netflix, get in the gym of the YouTube university. You have to learn 
and then you have to do. But the first and the hardest step is to decide. Mm -hmm. What we want is plastic surgery as a sector. We want to go on and just go lay on the table, get the nip and the tuck, show up with a bad body six weeks later. And what I'm suggesting is the hard work mm -hmm. of diet change, of sleeping and eating. Y'all can tell what's on my mind these days, right, friends? This is an example I'm, I'm thinking about. <laughs> the hard work is what is necessary, but the hardest part is to decide when nothing has happened to you. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is the thing that I keep coming back to when folks ask me, well, Sean, I don't know what else to do. And I'm like, yeah, anything you want to learn how to do, y'all can figure it out. Yeah. So, but the, but the decision one, decide. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that is a, that's where I would start. You decide as an individual, you get a couple of uh, your folks within your volunteer, your leadership group within the team. Yep. Then you go to board though. And that, and that board is a, uh, is a tough nut to crack because they have the, the way that we've always done it, right? Yep. That's the, the, the worst. We, we decry it here on the show all the time. Um, where does that conversation then begin? Is it a, we're all on board together. We need you on board. Is it, a, an, is it an explainer piece? How do you, um, yeah. that, that's a hard one, especially long-term organizations who have just never had to or have avoided talking about um, equity and uh, yep. systemic anything. And they don't want to disrupt the apple cart because they got old donors. They got old money. They got old they, stuff. Right, mm -hmm. old stuff. That's that. So let's just say you decide that as a group. And again, we're not going to solve every bit of problem. It's right. a 35 minute uh, podcast. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but, but, but again, th this is the conversation that I think a lot of people need to have in order to begin that, like you said, first step, right? It's yep. to think about it, then have an internal conversation, then decide. Once that decision's been made, or how do you bring the board along with those decisions as well? I think this is where the delicate dance comes in. So one of the things that was most fascinating to me in my early days was that there was this like gray area that the chief executive, whether you're an executive director or a CEO, um, lives in terms of decision making and that decision making matrix matrix with the board. Mm. And so there are some boards are also on an, on a complete arc, right? There are some boards who are I hate to say this, but rubber stamp boards who respond to their executive director and do whatever they say. And then there's some boards who take governance a bit too far mm -hmm. and are too in the weeds of the operations of the program. I need y'all to get out. Okay. So what we're looking for are the board members and the board who the CEO or the executive director can go to and say, in order for me to do my job, which is to operationalize our mission, these are the things that need to be true. Because it's not the board's job to operationalize the mission. It's their job to make sure that they, we have the resources, that we have the elevation, that we have the frame in order to be able to execute on mission. That's the strategy part. And so the C-suite the and the executive director in that entire C-suite, they have to be able to make that case to the board ultimately that it's their job to operationalize the mission. And part of operationalizing that mission is through the lens of equity. And here is what it means. Mm -hmm in order for us to be able to hit and meet our goals. And I think that starting that hard conversation is gonna be important because folks are gonna self-select. And what I say to leaders all the time, particularly leaders of organizations, you cannot be so afraid of losing funding that you will lose your people. That's that a, a, by the way, I just, I just found our pull quote for this whole episode right there. Um, but, but that, that, that's so, that's so amazing. I, I think the being afraid is what prevents so much potential in the nonprofit yeah. world, especially the small groups who don't know what their next step is going to be, or they're so fearful of losing a grant or so fearful. Of, uh, uh, how do you overcome that? Or how do you have conversations, those tough conversations with, with fear? Because that's a mindset issue too. And I think a lot oh, of it, 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 they've been just program to just be careful and, and you have to you're you're uh as a board member you're uh um you, you're you're responsible for you know finances and your your, your judicious Absolutely. responsibility that's right but but how do you conquer that as a as a as a brainwave this fear of if i do something different and take a risk everything will fall apart I think ultimately that's an internal challenge that I just have not been able to solve for. I have been able to, to help people like change their complete way of thinking, mm -hmm. but it has to be that you are willing to take risks. And actually leading an organization 
particularly if you founded that organization, is a risk. Mm -hmm. So I think the challenge is, is that we have become so detached from ourselves that we don't see ourselves as risk takers. And we lose sight of that for comfort. Mm -hmm. But you're not comfortable if you are worried about the, the one grant that's going to turn your whole upside, that organization upside down. Why do you want that funding if you have someone who's giving you money that is not aligned with your values? Mm -hmm. And so when organizations come to me in early stage, most of them trying to discourage them from becoming nonprofits. I'm like, we already had 1.5 yep. million in counting. Yep. We don't need any more. Um, but if they decide to do it, can we build out the mechanism properly? Can we build out our programs properly? Can we build out our evaluative tools before we need them? Can we build out our boards so that when we're bringing people onto the board, they understand the ethos of that board of directors and what their job is from early so that we are not attracting folks who ultimately their values do not align with ours, regardless of their money. Money is a tool and is not finite in that there are folks who will be able to give us resources, to share resources, to invest in our organizations if we lead with what we are trying to do and who we want to come along with us on the ride. Mm -hmm. who, who's the, what, what do you need to avoid? Who is the person, the personality that you need to um, really be wary of within leadership or board members? Uh, is, there, is, there a, is there a type of individual that you just need to go, okay, if I have this happening, all of, we stop the rails and we need to deal with this right away. Is there one that you can, uh, you know, or, or a handful of ones that you just, yeah, well, these are the things that you need to worry about? Because I think the majority of board members are having, have great intentions, they love it, they mm -hmm. want to do this, but mm -hmm. it can get hijacked really quickly by a handful of people who are just the worst. Worst. The, here's the ones that get hijacked, that if I can just open the side door and push them right out, do do, you know, yep. to, you know pull them yep. off the stage. The ones who never read any of the documentation or pre-work or don't come to any of the subcommittee calls, but want to derail every meeting, with questions that were answered in the pre-work. Mm -hmm. I want you all to exit stage left. Please stop. The person stop. who, peace out. The person who feels like, well, actually there aren't really, if we, if we diversify our board, um, what are we gonna do? There aren't really that many people of color um, who have wealth. What? I'm gonna need y'all to go. People who you feel like you're saving, mm. the people, the places, the things, the animals, that your mission, is geared towards you two gotta go does that save your complex the whole situation has to go and the people that, who say it's my money therefore i once you put it into the pot the pot goes into the operationalizing the strategy the strategy is where you can weigh in yeah and i think that that all of that so those are the board members i'll be like bye see you later on team the ones who do not have a people-centered view in that people are your number one asset in an organization and if you do not make sure that you are caring and feeding your employees, and that doesn't mean literally in their belly, although that's a good paycheck, but literally like with the types of practices and procedures you have inside your organization, with the ways people are promoted, who is promoted, when and why, with the ways you reward folks, with the ways you honor people, with the ways you give them the choice assignments, we can see that lazy Susan. Mm -hmm. And if it never stops on me, mm -hmm. then those are the people I want gone mm -hmm. because they're not seeing the whole picture. Yeah. Um, and those who want to do all the things themselves because they don't trust people. It's not that they don't trust people, Badger, because they don't trust themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the more interesting things in your bio is, um, and I picked this out. I don't know why I picked this out. I was drawn to it. I've never seen it in one. This is why I was interested. Um, I let go three people. You, you're responsible for letting go three yeah. people. Yeah. I, I, it's such an, uh, uh, a, transparently wonderful thing to put in there. And I don't know why that I just focused in on that. Um, how, how do you, cause nonprofit, I'm a, we're a bleeding heart. We want to make everybody, they can't, we can't let everybody go. We'll just make it uncomfortable and they leave on their own. You know, as we're kind of talking about leadership and, and, and sort of bold mm -hmm. changes or whatever, you've got somebody who's listening that is knows that they've got a, a problem child sitting in that, in that mm -hmm. office but they sure don't want to be the bad person, right? They don't want to be the one who is blamed for the, the culture of firing. And now we're all fearing for our job. Mm -hmm. what, would you mind walking? I know this weird off the topic thing, but it's just so cool. appropriate as we're talking about this leadership thing and how do you make these dramatic changes? How did you go through your letting go of staff members? 
Yeah, first of all, I, I have a, what I learned this when I was a resident director um, right after grad school, an OHD philosophy, open, honest, and direct. And I heard that in an orientation and it stuck with me so heavy and it stayed with me all these years. And so that is how I lead. So you know what I expect from day one. Mm -hmm. You know what the bar is. You've had time to ask the questions. I check in with my team to make sure that they're getting the resources they need to be successful. And I'm perfectly cool with letting folks when I don't when I don't letting folks know when I don't know and when I have failed. So we this is a two-way street. So how we get to the firing is you knew what your expectations were, you asked for the resources you needed, mm -hmm. you were given the resources you needed, you were giving time to step into that, you didn't meet the bar. You didn't meet the bar, you didn't meet the bar. And at the point where I realized it's not a matter of what I call like episodic where something is happening in your personal life that derails you completely from your work. That happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you, the core competency is necessary for the role, you don't have it. Or you're not willing to work toward it or you're the best you're going to ever be is about a five out of 10. We don't need that either on the team. You got to go. So my team members know I will go on hot coals for them to get what they need. But I'm gonna need you to do the same thing to get our results. Mm -hmm. And those who do not do that, they know I will help you find happiness somewhere else. Because if I don't act as a manager, it's not the one that I'm worried about. It's the five, it's the 10, it's the different departments, it's the other folks who interface with us all the time that I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. Because being a bad guy is not your issue. Not leading is your issue. And your team who don't have these performance problems or personality problems or whatever are looking at you like, excuse me, Kashana, what are you? No, so no, so never. So we're not doing anything. So we're not solving any problem, nothing. And I don't need that in my ranks of folks because I want folks to be able to show up to do their best and baddest work and also bring themselves fully to the work that they do. And you can't do that when you, when you are unafraid, when you are afraid to demonstrate that you will make the hard decisions. And so if I have to make a hard decision around hiring, you can trust that I will make the hard decisions around saying no to funders that we, that do not align with us. I will make the hard decisions about saying no to expand because we're being pressured to do so. I will make the hard decisions to freeze hiring or put people on furlough so we can all keep our jobs. Mm -hmm. So it's emblematic of the other hard decisions that you can trust that I as a leader will be willing to make because of that thing. So it's not about the firing. It's about the domino effect. So that's what I've got for you, Patrick. I don't know if uh, I hope it helps somebody. That, that's what I got. It, it's so brilliant because I think we walk on eggshells because we don't want to offend people. We don't want to, uh, bring, like you said, we don't want to bring up hard conversations. This work is hard for God's hard. sakes. Every time, every day you wake up, you, you go in with a, um, the most positive attitude you could possibly be and you get, you open up your email and you're like, ah, oh, shit. Like, mm -hmm. It's like, it's one of those things you're like, oh, oh. <laughs> right? And so then it, it falls off the rails really quickly. And I know you talk about priorities and we could talk for another 48 hours on the, a lot of these things, right? It's just, this is so wonderful. We'll have you back because we've got a litany yeah. of more topics to talk Love about. But, but that's, but that's the, I think, the, the leadership and the management and making hard decisions and taking risks and having uh, conversations about equity. That all Mac, This is really where I think we need to go in the nonprofit sector is that people are terrified of doing something that is, they know is the right way to go it, but they don't want to offend other people along the way that they know is the right way to go. Absolutely. Because because of the funding issues, because of the old school leadership issues, because of some of these uh, decision trees that you you don't know what's going to happen. Therefore, you don't want to make a move forward, right? And you're paralyzed to not make a decision. And then that really, I think, it exposes who you are as a leader in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think this is just such a wonderful thing to just have that starting conversation with yourself as a leader in the nonprofit world on how do you manage yourself better in order to just Absolutely. sort of, right? Absolutely. And, and, and if you've heard anything I've ever said, if anybody looks me up and sees things that I've said, my, even from my tweets to my videos, I, oh, I talk about self so much, you would think that I'm probably the most self-centered person, but if you look closely at my work, it's really not focused on me, even though my bright, shiny face is on lots of things. But I want to tell y'all, <laughs> like 80% of the work that I do is about wake up people mm -hmm. and focus on yourself. Why? Because if you are well, 
then you will lead well. Mm -hmm. If you are taking care of yourself at home, then you will lead well at work. Mm -hmm. If things are out of control in other parts of your life, you will seek more control at work. Mm -hmm. If you are feeling controlled at work, you will lash out by doing crazy things to self-sabotage because you are seeking control. We can have a whole talk about that. No, so geez, I, so if, I, there's, there's our extended after hours, <laughs> uh, after dark uh, conversation. After dark, yes, I love that. We need, it. we need an entire podcast where we just have like it's it's cocktails. We're all in uh, pajamas and we all get super real. And it's not. That, I mean, that'd be so fun. That'd be so good. Um, so for for those of us uh, who are listening, and uh, I want to get to know Kashana way better, and I want to follow her, and I want to get opinions from her. I want to be her super best friend. Come on. Uh, how do people get a hold of you? Um, and how, and what else do you have going on? I know we talked really briefly about sort of uh, a couple of the retreats that you were holding, uh, yeah. whatever, how to get people a hold of you. What do you have coming up? How do people get involved with what you are talking about? Cause I think this is going to resonate with way more people than you think. Cause this is, yeah. it, cause it's, it's, it's going to hit a nerve to go. This is exactly what I needed to hear today. I appreciate that. So I am on social media across all platforms at Fund Diva, F-U-N-D-D-I-V-A, Fund Diva. So you can catch me on the Twitters and the Instagrams and the YouTubes, everywhere. Fund Diva, you can look me up. Um, or you can look me up on my website at Kashana Co, K-I-S-H-S-H-A-N-A-C-O.com. And you can find out about my services, which are management and leadership training, retreats and coaching, um, and consulting assignments, and, so, and my team. Um, so I'm super excited to have a small crew. We do mighty work. Um, and one of the big pieces of mighty work I, I've done for the last two years, and now we're launching our first uh, retreat conference, if you will, um, is the Rooted Collaborative, which is a global community for women of color um, around the world um, who are in fundraising, whether you are a frontline fundraiser, operations uh, person, donor communications, at a foundation, political fundraiser. Um, we're going to be having our first retreat. It's virtual, y'all. So it's a stay-at-home retreat, July 22nd to the 24th. And you can find out more about that if you go to therootedretreat.com. Okay. That's what I've got going on. So good. I'm going to have all of that info in the show notes. You can go follow. And then yes, you know, when I you're sitting at your desk and you're wondering what the hell you want to do with your life and management and leadership, you don't know what's yes, going on. Book you, call with me. you send her an email. It's going to be all right. This has been so much fun. We have to have you back because there's so many more Love things we're going to talk about for so like much fun. the next 15 hours, for goodness sakes. Um, <laughs> but, but, but so wonderful. And I and so appreciate your perspective and so appreciate the conversation. So if you're listening out there, you go to Kashana Co. Uh, com, and then you go and follow the links and follow her on social and say hi and tell them that the official Do Good Better podcast sent you. Sean, thank you so much for being a guest. Thank on. you so the much official. for having me. This is super fun. We're going to have you back in the, and we'll see you next time here on the official Do Good Better podcast.